All right, the goal today uh, is twofold. Uh, first of all, like usual, we got two lectures, lectures 16A and 16B. In 16A, I want to review some things that we've done, talked about already, but I do want to focus more on proofs than I have and trying to be careful about those proofs. We'll review again A, G, and G. We'll emphasize that they are examples of something called mathematical invariance. Look at the converse of Lagrange's theorem and see again that it's false and verify that it's false with an example and prove that example is a counterexample for the converse of Lagrange's theorem. But you might wonder, are there partial converses of Lagrange's theorem that might be true? What, what does that mean? We'll have to look and see. And then again, we'll look at the orbit stabilizer theorem, looking more carefully at the proof I talk about, talked about briefly at the end last time. Uh, probably next time we'll look, look into some applications of it. Then in lecture 16b, we're going to focus on chapter 8, on um, what are called external direct products. All right, so what is a, what does it mean to be a mathematical invariant here? Excuse me while I put this in here. By the way, you can think of this as really being an, an application of odd G and NG, at least to our classification purposes. They are mathematical invariants. What does that mean? Well, in this context, it means if you've got two groups, G1 and G2, that are isomorphic, then both odd G1 and odd G2 are isomorphic as well, and NG1 and NG2 are isomorphic. You've got two different isomorphisms that come from this. G1 being isomorphic to G2 implies both that ought G1 is isomorphic to ought G2 and in G1 is isomorphic to in G2. I claim that's a useful thing. How is it useful in our classification scheme? Well, think about the contrapositive of this. If either odd G1 and odd G2 are not isomorphic, or if NG1 and NG2 are not isomorphic, then G1 and G2 are also not isomorphic. Okay, so just like uh, we saw with the theorems about isomorphisms acting on group elements or on groups themselves, you can use this to get negative results, so to speak, which are, which are not bad, those are good things to know when two groups are not isomorphic. For example, we saw back in chapter six that if you've got an isomorphism between group, two groups, it means they have the same number of elements of every given order, say like order 10 or something. So if you had two groups that had different numbers of elements of order 10, they could not be isomorphic. This is a similar kind of thing. There's a warning in all this though. Just because they are isomorphic, odd G1 and odd G2 are isomorphic, and NG1 and NG2 are isomorphic, does not necessarily mean G1 and G2 are isomorphic. In other words, the converse of this is not true. The contrapositive is, right? Remember converse versus contrapositives from discrete math? If you've got an implication, P implies Q. It's contrapositive is not Q implies not P. This is my little symbol for not here. If this implication is true, if this if-then statement is a theorem, it's true, then the contrapositive will be true because they mean the same thing really. Also, if this happens to be false, this will be false too. They are equivalent statements. The converse, however, is not equivalent. Q implies P. If this implication is true, this may or may not be true. And in this context, it's not true. There are examples where odd G1 and odd G2, for example, are isomorphic, but G1 and G2 themselves are not isomorphic. Let me give you a quick example. There was an exercise where we tried to figure out what odd of Z was group of all automorphisms of Z. Remember that exercise? It was a completion one. There were 
only two elements in this, in this group. Because an automorphism of Z has to map a generator of Z to it, another generator of Z, but there are only two generators of Z. One and negative one. So if you got an automorphism, it either needs to map one to itself, or it needs to map one to negative one. Those are the only two possibilities. There are two elements in this automorphism group. In fact, it's isomorphic to Z2. Another example of a group whose group of automorphisms is isomorphic to Z2 would be, for example, uh, Z3. Its group of automorphisms is isomorphic to U3, which is isomorphic to Z2. It's got two elements in it, one and two. On the multiplication there, right? One is the identity. In Z3, that's addition, zero is the identity, but the group of automorphisms is isomorphic to this, which is isomorphic to that. So here you have two non-isomorphic groups, Z and Z3, whose corresponding group of automorphisms are isomorphic. But again, that fits the warning case. That doesn't, just because these are isomorphic, Z2 is isomorphic to Z2, that does not mean that these are the same. Let me prove the first bullet uh, for the case of the ought instead of the in. Let's label this as a theorem if you like. Theorem if G1 and G2 are groups with G1 isomorphic to G2, then ought G1 is isomorphic to ought G2. It's an invariant. It doesn't change if you change to another group that's isomorphic. That's what an invariant means. switch from one group to another isomorphic group and then apply this automorphism thing. It doesn't change the isomorphism class. These are still isomorphic. This is kind of a tricky proof. I'm going to go about doing it. Well, let's go ahead and start by saying suppose G1 and G2 are isomorphic. exists an isomorphism. I will use abbreviations here from G1 to G2. We must prove that these two groups are isomorphic. isomorphic. So I guess we have to come up with an isomorphism from this one to this one, say. How in the world? we got to come up with an isomorphism. This part is easy to write. Define, oh, let's call it capital V. From odd G1 to odd G2. By capital V what? what? Now it gets hard. I know I want to define an isomorphism from odd G1 to odd G2. What should it be? What should its formula be? How do I define it? This is the tricky part. It's helpful in these contexts sometimes to draw diagrams. What kind of diagram? Usually you put the function name in front of the domain, but sometimes people put the function above the arrow or below the arrow. So phi maps G1 to G2, little v. I'm going to define a capital phi from here to here. Should I draw those groups in this picture somewhere? Well, no, you don't have to. I mean, you could, but what, what does that mean? I, I want to say what capital phi does to an arbitrary element in odd G1. Call that arbitrary element alpha. 
can I put alpha in the picture somewhere? Yeah, you can. Alpha is an automorphism of G1. It maps G1 to itself. Maybe I should do something like this. That's alpha. I want to map alpha under capital Phi to some automorphism of G2. Some function that maps G2 to itself, question mark. If you think long and hard enough about this, the only way this seems possible to do is to maybe start with the mapping, well, you got to have a domain that's equal to G2. I got to use phi, little phi and alpha some way. How do I use them? Maybe I should apply phi inverse, then alpha, then phi. That would be a function that maps G2 to itself. So it's really not over here, so to speak. It's going back this way, around this way, then back over this way. I mean, I could go ahead and draw this as well. But what I'm really after here, it seems, is applying phi inverse first, then applying alpha, then applying phi. And remember, with function composition, you work right to left. I think that's what I want. That seems like the only possible thing you could possibly even guess when you think about it long and hard enough about what's going on here. Should I say it again? Say it again? Capital Phi has got to be a function from this set to this set, take an automorphism of G1 and calling it alpha, or maps G1 to itself. I want to map that alpha onto something that maps G2 to itself, and hopefully is an automorphism of G2. Based on this picture, it seems like the only way you can do that using the given information is to first apply Phi inverse, which does exist since Phi is an isomorphism then apply alpha, then apply phi to go from G2 back to itself. Is this really an automorphism of G2? Certainly it doesn't map G2 to itself. Is it one-to-one -one onto an operation preserving? Yeah. I'm not going to prove that, but you can use all the facts we know from the past. When you compose one-to-one -one functions, you get a one-to-one -one function. When you compose onto functions, you get an onto function. And we have seen when you compose operation preserving functions, you get an operation preserving function. We have seen that, at least with two functions composed. It does apply to three as well. But are we done? No. We gotta verify capital Phi is an isomorphism still. We gotta verify its one-to-one -one onto an operation preserving. Capital Phi is one to one. Assume, say, capital Phi of alpha equals capital Phi of beta, where beta is some other automorphism in, of G1. They're both elements of uh, G1. That implies well, with the formula for capital Phi, that little phi alpha, little phi inverse equals little phi beta, little phi inverse again. Oh, you say jump for joy. I can cancel, right? Cancel the phi's and the phi inverses. Alpha must equal beta. Capital Phi must be one to one. Well, can I really cancel the phi and phi inverse? Technically speaking, not by anything we've proved so far, actually, because we only prove the cancellation law within a given group. Alpha and beta are in odd G1, which is a group, but phi is not in odd G1. Phi maps G1 to G2. And phi inverse goes from G2 to G1. It's not in that group. So does the left and can right cancellation law work here? I'm just composing functions that are not in the same group here. It still does work. You still can compose. You can, for example, left composed by phi inverse. For example, even though phi and phi inverse are not in this group here, you can still do the function composition. And the associative law still works. And 
phi inverse phi is still the identity map. I call it ID. It would be the identity map of what? It would be the identity map, identity map of G1. ID G1. Because you apply phi first and then phi inverse. I won't show the details. You could also apply phi on the right side, ultimately to get to, to alpha equals beta. So the capital E is 1, 1. How about onto? Is capital phi onto? Given a beta, does there exist an alpha so that this is true? Although now here in this notation, beta would be in aught G2, not aught G1. Well, if you set this equal to that, you can solve for alpha. Once again, by applying phi inverse to both on the left of both sides and applying phi itself on the right of both sides, alpha would have to actually be phi inverse beta phi. Given beta in aught G2, let alpha equal, it would be phi inverse beta phi. And that does map G1 to itself. This is in aught G1. If you think about this diagram again, think with me here. First apply phi, go from G1 to G2, then apply beta, go from G2 to itself, then apply phi inverse, go back to G1. This is in aught G1. And, well then, capital phi of alpha is capital phi of little phi beta, little phi, little phi inverse beta, little phi, which by the formula for capital phi is phi, then phi inverse beta phi, then phi inverse, looking up here. And then the phi's and phi inverses cancel. They give you identity maps with the initial of the law in the robot for beta. Can you see that down there? This head's a little in the way, but it's fine. Okay. Is capital fee operation preserved? That's the only thing left. Let's go way over here. For example, what is capital fee of alpha? Composed with capital phi of beta. Now beta is back in aught G1. In the on two case, I was assuming it was on aught G2. What is this? Well, with the formula for capital phi, this is going to be little phi alpha, little phi inverse, composed with little phi beta, little phi inverse. Again, the associative law still works. Alpha and beta are in groups where phi is not. This still gives you the identity of the appropriate group, and this simplifies to phi alpha beta phi inverse, which is capital phi of alpha composed with beta. This might seem like just a bunch of abstract nonsense. In fact, that phrase, abstract nonsense, actually has a precise definition in math. Anything kind of like this, it's proofs. Kind of similar to something called category theory, is sometimes pejoratively called abstract nonsense, even by mathematicians. But it actually does have significance, okay? We're proving something, we're proving this theorem. And that is an important theorem. Verifying that this ought idea is a mathematical invariant. Isomorphic groups produce isomorphic auto groups of automorphisms. And therefore, again, the contrapositive is true. If these are not isomorphic, then these are not isomorphic, which is a good thing, a good tool to have.
Remember I said last time that the converse to Lagrange's theorem is false. Just because a positive integer k, k divides the order n of a finite group does not mean that the group has a subgroup of order k. To verify that statement, you can just come up with one example, though of course there are plenty of examples. One example is good enough to verify that the converse of Lagrange's theorem is false. One counterexample is good enough to verify any statement is false. One example is that A4, which has order 12, right? 4 factorial divided by 2, turns out to have no subgroup of order 6. I mentioned this last time that it's, you should study the proof in the book. If it's a tricky proof, but I thought it was a, it's, a, it's an interesting proof, okay? Cool proof. And I said, you should maybe be able to do it on the exam, maybe with some hints. Okay, I'm not going to write out the proof fully for sake of time, but let's just go over the idea of the proof. Claim A4 has no subgroup of order 6 in spite of the fact that 6 divides 12, which is the order of A4, 4 factorial over 2 is 12. And that's enough to verify that the converse of Grange's theorem is false. Again, just because k divides n does not mean there's a subgroup of order k. Why? Why or why not? It's an argument by contradiction. Outline of proof. Suppose to the contrary, that H is a subgroup of A4 with order of H being 6. Now, you do need to use what you know about A4, right? I mean, A4 must be relevant here in some way, because, for example, Z12 is a group of order 12 that does have a subgroup of order 6. A unique subgroup of order 6, the one generated by 2. So the fact that we're talking about A4 must be relevant. We must need to use some fact about A4, and this might be, if I put this on the test, where I give you this a hint, essentially. I'd say, recall that A4 has eight elements of order three, which is the key fact used. A4 has eight elements of order three. Think about this here. Three cycles are even permutations, you can do this trick to write them as a product of an even number of two cycles. And three cycles do have order three. And if you're in A4, you've got four choices for the first one, three choices for the second, and two for the third. However, in the cycle notation, you've got three different ways of writing the same three cycle. So all together, you've got 4 times 3 times 2 divided by 3, or 8 different 3 cycles from in A4. What else is in A4? Well, the identity is 2. That gives you 9 elements. What are the other 3? The other 3 are products of 2 cycles. These 3 of them. And because two cycles, and because disjoint cycles commute, you could write those same products of two cycles in another way. So you don't you don't have to. It's good enough just to think about these examples and see that that's all there is. Those have order two. 
not a retreat. Let A be an A4, B A3 psych, uh, an element of order 3. The claim here is that A is an H, and if that claim is true, that's going to be enough to be a contradiction because A is an arbitrary element of order 3, of which there are 8 of them, but H only has 6 elements. Say that again. If this claim is true, if an arbitrary element of order 3 in A4 is an H, that's a contradiction. Because there are eight elements of order three, but H only has six elements. Now, in fact, only five non-identity elements. That would be the contradiction. Or this is a contradiction. Therefore, such an H does not exist. The rest of the work, the rest of the tricky work, comes in proving this claim. There's some steps there. You could, you could do a contradiction argument for that, actually. Assume to the contrary. That A is not an H. You do need to use the fact that H has order 6 and A4 has order 12, we call it B here, since that's, that's the case, H has order 6 and A4 has order 12, the index of H and A4, remember, remember this notation from last time? The number of distinct left cosets of H and A4 is the order of A4 divided by the order of H, which is 12 divided by 6, which is 2. There are only two distinct left cosets. Therefore, since A is not an H, I can say A4 is H union with the left coset AH. And I can also remark H intersect the left coset containing A is empty. Do you get that? That's kind of the, that's another key on this proof. I think I'd have to give you a few hints on this proof. But it's it's really cool proof, I think. It's real interesting. Perhaps the most interesting proof we've seen so far. This would be true. This would be your, your partition of A4 would consist of these two cosets if A is not an H. And this is going to be a contradiction. How? Well, <coughs> what does this mean, for example? This step is not obvious. Probably would require a hint. About A squared, for example. A squared is an A4. So it's either got to be an H or an AH. I claim both of those assumptions lead to contradictions. I think the other one, the second one's easier. If A squared is an AH, then A squared must be A times some little h, that's in capital H. You can see this okay? But then left cancellation would imply that A equals H, which is in capital H, which is a contradiction. Arrows pointing at each other? Contradiction, because I assumed A was not an H. What about the other one? What if A squared is an H? That leads to a contradiction, too. I'm forgetting offhand what it is. I'm going to peek. Oh yeah, square that now. Another trick. 
A squared squared must also be an H by closure. H is the subgroup of G. But what is A squared squared? This is A to the fourth. But wait a minute, A had over three. That must be important some way. It was important one way there. It's also important over here. A to the fourth must be A. So A must be an H. Contradiction. We're done. Wow. I like it a lot, but yeah, I'm realizing as I go through this, I need to give you a few hints. Maybe I'd outline the proof for you on the test that you'd fill in steps, fill in reasons or something. But I just think this is the coolest proof that we've had so far. Really, it really takes some ingenuity, some probably some experimenting. You know, when you do proof, sometimes you just have to try things and see what happens. Probably the first person to discover this proof just had to do some trial and error with trying different things. For example, trying to think about a squared and to think about squaring a squared, for example. Spend the time to go over it again. Do you want to look at the proof of the orbit stabilizer theorem now? Oh, by the way, I should say quickly that there, there are partial converses of the Lorentz theorem that are true. Perhaps the most famous one is something called Silo's first theorem. Do not say Silo. Say Silo. Okay. Very tempting to say Silo. Silo. Silo's first theorem, uh, which is pretty advanced. It's in chapter 24 of our book. We will not get to it. Um, though if we ever, ever do a second semester uh, here at Bethel, which we don't right now, of algebraic structures. Heaven forbid. Uh, some, a lot of schools do do second semesters. We would probably get to see those theorem there. So if I ever teach this in a second semester again, we'd get to see those first theorem there. It says if G is a finite group and P is a prime, emphasis on the word prime, and if p to the k divides the order of g, then g has at least one subgroup order of p to the k. But p must be prime. So prime powers that divide the order of a given group are situations where you have at least one subgroup of that order, of that prime power. Okay, so it's a partial converse. Six is not a prime power, it's two times three. So it doesn't fit this. Well, actually, maybe we're better to take the quiz here. Let's take the quiz, and then we'll talk about the proof of the orbit stabilizer.